Right, guys, let's start recording. Um, first of all, before we even start, Dom, I, I was wondering what you're going to be wearing, and you did not disappoint. Look at the cap and the the hat. Sorry, the the jersey is. You didn't disappoint. Okay. Um, <laughs> hey guys, hope everyone's well. Um, yeah. We'll just crack it straight onto it. Dom. Um, um, we'll crash straight onto it and um, any anyone that comes late, we're recording it anyway and I'll just let them in as and when. Um, so welcome guys, uh, we're really lucky today to have um, a good friend of ours, uh, Roy Carroll, former Manchester United, West Ham, Olympiacos and Northern Ireland goalkeeper, amongst a couple of other teams. Um, he says, Dom, that the worst team he played for was Manchester United. If you believe that, you believe anything. He didn't really say that. <laughs> um, so yeah, so um, we're going to go on. If it's all right with you, Roy, what we'll do, we'll start with, um, if you don't mind just giving a little bit, I guess, a background of your career or summary of your career, and then I'll, uh, I've got a few questions for you if that's all right, and then we'll open up to the group, and Dom's got about 5,000 questions about all about Manchester United for you. So. No problem at all, Harry. no problem, mate. Um, yeah, my name's Roy Carroll. Uh, I'm 43 years old now. I started playing football when I was... Sorry, soccer, when I was uh, about seven, eight years old. I was a striker then days because I wasn't too big. I wasn't big enough to be a goalkeeper. But then uh, I decided to be in goals when I was 14. Started growing really tall when I was 14, 15 years old. And then uh, I got my opportunity to go to England. I'm from a country called Northern Ireland. It's a very small country. I don't know if anybody's heard of it from, uh, from over there, but... Uh, it's a small country, so the opportunity for me to move to England at 16, 17 years old was massive for me because I always wanted to be a professional soccer player. And uh, I, I went over as a, a schoolboy. I uh, just turned 17 years old. And uh, after I think it was after five or six months, I think Laurie played for him as well. It was whole city sent me as a professional player at 17 years old. So my dream came through. And I end up uh, moving up the leagues with different clubs. And uh, I moved six years later to a big team called Manchester United many, many years ago in 2001. And uh, I've played 72 games for Manchester United, won the Premier League, won the FA Cup. And uh, I really enjoyed my time. Met a lot of good, good players. Everybody knows Ronaldo, don't they? Everyone knows Ronaldo. They're bound to know Ronaldo. So I, I met Ronaldo, I met David Beckham and uh, a lot of great players. The attitude of those players at Manchester United was unbelievable. The attitude of training, working hard and giving everything you can on the training pitch to play on a Saturday is a massive thing in, at, at Manchester United. The winners and the, the winners and the want to win games and uh, even on the training pitch, they want to win the little five sides. It's it's one of those situations when I went in and Roy Keane was the leader and he was the captain of Manchester United. It was fantastic. But things happened uh, for me after them four years. I ended up moving to West Ham. Uh, it was another Premier League team. Went to West Ham. It didn't work out. It didn't work out at West Ham. Then I moved up to Glasgow Rangers in Scotland. Then I moved abroad to uh, a team in Denmark and uh, a team in Greece as well. So I played quite a few teams over my career and I played for a, a massive team in Greece called Olympiagos and it was really, really good. Enjoyed my time right there. Nobody understood me though because uh, I was from Northern Ireland and they were all speaking Greek so it was very difficult sometimes. <laughs> but it was, um, was marvellous. I, I played for my country 45 months. Uh, listen to him. <laughs> Give me a, 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 a played 45 games for my country uh, for Northern Ireland. I've made my debut at 19 for my country, so that was a, the biggest honour as well. Become a, a player for my country. Everybody loves playing for the country over this part of the world, and that was my one of my biggest dreams as well. So, two of my big dreams came through, and I, I did dream for it when I was 13, 14 years old, and I was quite lucky to get the opportunity to play in professional football and play for my country as well. So that's a little bit of an insight of my my career. It's been up and down. Sometimes you have good days. Sometimes you have bad days. It's the way you bounce back when you have don't have the best of days. It's always bouncing back the right way. Never give up. Never give up. No matter how old you are, you never give up. You keep working hard. 
and uh, you can have the best talent in the world, but if you don't work hard enough, talent can really take you so far. And uh, managers and coaches want to see you doing really well for yourselves. Okay, Larry. Thanks, Mel. Um, well, starting off then, so the first few questions we've got is, um, was it, because uh, it's, it's obviously different in, in the States, but was it a scary decision to move away from home so early on your own to try and forge a, a football career, a soccer career? Uh, not at not the first time. Uh, I'm from a small village, like, and it was about 70 houses and one, one grocery shop, like, so it was very small. Everybody knew everybody. But for me, was my dream was, as I said before, I'm a professional fo- uh, soccer player and uh, the opportunity to go to England. Oh, I forgot to tell you a story, by the way. We lost a game 5-1 when I was playing for the man's te- a men's team when I was 16. We lost the game 5-1. And a scout came up to me afterwards and said, would you like me to go for a trial? Because we've seen your attitude and the game was unbelievable. And I said, just let five goals in. And he said, Roy, it doesn't matter. Your attitude was brilliant till from the f- first kickoff till the final whistle. You didn't change your attitude. So that's another thing what that stuck in my mind at the time. But when I did move over to England, uh, for the first two months, it, was, it did get very difficult for me because I, I just stayed in my apartment uh, with my digs lady and uh, it was the family who was looking after me and it was very difficult for me to go out and socialize with other people because I was from a small area and uh, but my dad spoke to me about two or three months afterwards and Roy, it's, Roy you have to stick it out because my brother had the opportunity to play in England as well but he turned it down and uh, that was that was my thinking in my head I want to be a professional football like everybody else and and uh, I don't want to throw this chance uh, away and uh, I started going out and socializing and doing other things outside football. Um, and that was the main thing what got me got me really going and t- talking with teammates and getting used to different uh, different culture. I know it was really only across the water, like, but it's still a big difference from uh, a little village from Northern Ireland over to a big city like Hull. Hull, Hull is probably one of the biggest cities in England. Uh, when I was over there in 1995, I moved over, 1995, which was a long, long time. All right, mate. Um, so you signed for um, for Hull City. You've left home. How long did it take you to get into the uh, to the first team squad and to to make your debut? Well, I was um, I was in and out training with them, but uh, I think after I think it was after three months uh, because I was looking forward to go back home for Christmas because normally you have two weeks off over Christmas and New Year as you, as a schoolboy and. Uh, the manager brought me in the office, the first team manager brought me in the office and he says, Roy, uh, we're going to put you on the bench for Boxing Day and, uh, and I couldn't wait, like, but I was homesick and I was still wanted to go home and see my family, but Lisa, Lisa was going to be in the squad. Uh, I think it was like, uh, I moved over in October, so it was like three or four months I was in the first team. Um, at the time, the first team keeper, was a lot of rumours about the first team keeper leaving, leaving to go to... Uh, a Premier League team at the time. So uh, he ended up leaving then after Christmas and uh, I got my opportunity in the first team playing football and uh, play, I think my debut was 17 and against Swindon, I can remember it clearly. It was, uh, we ended up losing the game 3-0, but it was still some experience play, playing your first game in English football. That's amazing, mate. Um, I know that well, a lot of the, the boys and girls on here know uh, Mike uh, Edwards. Mike is also uh, one of our ambassadors. Did you play with him that day or was it around that period as well? Yeah, me, me and Mike, yeah, he's a great guy. He was a whole city. He's a young lad. Me and him was uh, in the same youth team at the start. Uh, and uh, it was great experience to play, work with uh, Mike as well. And funny enough, I finished my professional career with Mike at Notts County. Uh, about four years ago, five years ago, and uh, it was a great pleasure to see him again. He's one of the top guys I've ever played football with, uh, not just on the pitch, but off the pitch as well. Really dedicated to the game, which is fantastic from a, a guy like that. But we had a few arguments because we're teammates and we want to win games, and, and that's, that's just the way football was back in them days. We, we just wanted to win uh, no matter what game you're playing, and uh, friendly matches or or uh, behind closed doors, you just want to go out and win games. 
Well, I was going to say, because I watched you a lot in Notts County and yeah, you definitely screened at him a lot. So I, I knew you must have liked him. <laughs> no, big, big Mike knows me, like, and I know Mike. You have to be careful in these, this day and age because you have to, you have to, you have to know which ones you can shout at and which ones you can't shout at. And that's the truth. I came back to play in Belfast, my, um, in Northern Ireland, and uh, I shouted at one guy one time and he never spoke to me for two months. And I just thought, oh my word, I have to be careful at least this day and age. But the Kimia, you have, you have, uh, football, uh, soccer's changing a lot this day and age. And, and uh, I became a goalkeeping coach now, and uh, I have to change my attitude towards uh, coaching as well because you have to adapt to everything in life. I'm still mad in the head, though. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, so is Chris. Don't worry about that. That's fine. <laughs> um, Roy, so you um, you obviously got in the first team, started playing all the games, and then started to get linked with uh, other moves. Um, so how did the how did your move come about from Hull City? Yeah, the move came along. Uh, I moved to another team in the same division. They just won the league. It was a strange uh, transfer because normally you have to wait till the new season back in them days. And uh, they put all the players up for sale. It was crazy. They put all the players up for sale. And uh, quite a few teams came in for me. And the only team that came in for me was a team called Wigan Athletic. And they just, got, they were get, they just won the league and they're getting promoted for the next season up to League One. And uh, they paid the money. The, the the price tag in them days was three hundred and fifty thousand pounds, like, and and uh, that helped it up in the Premier League. So it was fantastic. I'm not saying I saved the club or not, like, but uh, it was just uh, the opportunity to help uh, hold City out because uh, your first club, my first club in England, uh, definitely, definitely, uh, you always have a bit of uh, always sticks with you, like, and I really enjoyed my time at Hull. I was only there for a year and a half, but I really enjoyed it, and I moved to Wigan then and. I was at Wigan for four years uh, playing. Just couldn't get promoted. We were in the playoffs a couple of times, uh, twice in four seasons, but we just couldn't get over the final line. And then and the big the big boys would come and knocking on the door and say, like Everton, Leicester was asking me to come uh, to the Premier League. And uh, then a, another team came in. I forgot that team who came in for me again. Dom, what's, his, what's that? Manchester United, wasn't it? Manchester United came in. <laughs> But I was a, it was a big story that was, hey, because I was supposed to be signing for Leicester and shook hands on it. Uh, Peter Taylor was the manager at the time, and uh, he he rang me up about, he rang me up on a Sunday, and he said, Roy, I'm going for experienced goalkeepers because I was still uni young, I was still 23 years old, and uh, he says he's going for the top man goalkeeper, Ian Walker. So I was really upset, like I thought I was going to get a chance to move to the Premier League, but then I got a phone call and. Uh, it was Sir Alex wanted to speak to me, uh, and I just put the phone down because I just thought it was loads of, load of lies. Like I didn't think, why is Sir Alex ringing me for? You know what I mean? It was one of those situations. But uh, uh, I got a phone call back and says, no, he wants to speak to you tomorrow, and that was it. So just to put that into context, guys, for I don't know how it, you expect it to work uh, in professional soccer, but yeah. So what Roy's saying is that the greatest Manchester United manager ever and probably the greatest man, uh, manager in, in soccer, in professional soccer, certainly in Europe, has uh, get, called him to ask him to join Manchester United and Roy no, didn't believe him. Somebody else rang. It wasn't it was Alex. Else, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was someone from the radio taking, uh, having a little bit of fun like, but it wasn't. It was, uh, it was one of his uh, secretaries who was asking me to come down for a meeting with him. That's brilliant. So obviously, I presume you made your mind was made up straight away, and you went there the next day and didn't take much persuading. Yeah, uh, it was it was a weird situation for me because uh, he was watching me for two years because we we opened a new stadium at uh, at Wigan, and it was Manchester United that came and helped, uh, opened the stadium for us, and that was two years. And uh, it, when when I had the meeting, he was talking to me. He says, "I've been watching you for two years, which was uh, unbelievable." When you have a a manager like that there uh, and bringing his scouts and everybody to watch me for two years. So I must have been doing something right. And uh, I, I did talk to him and I, I'd never had a goalkeeping, full-time goalkeeping coach in my whole career until I went to Manchester United. And I was going to go to Manchester United, play play with the best players in the world, train with the best players in the world. And I was going to learn as well. If you don't, if you can't learn at Manchester United, you can't learn anywhere. 
And uh, I knew he was going in as a number two because Fabian Bartes was a world-class goalkeeper. He's won the World Cup. He's won up many major tournaments for uh, France. So I, I knew he was going in as number two. And uh, lucky enough for me, my first game was probably the fourth game in the season. And I got my opportunity. And it was strange, strange, uh, strange feeling because the, the other keeper against, uh, we were playing Aston Villa and the other keeper was Peter Smeichel at the time. So uh, he was the legend at Manchester United, and I was a young pop. At the, I was a young lad at the Manchester United at the time, and it was like over the moon, like to play against the ex Manchester United goalkeeper. So you um, just before we go on to the United stories, then Roy, what you know, you've gone, you've signed, you've gone in your first day. What's that like going in amongst you? Know, I, don't, I forget the actual, you know, the roster now, as we would say here, but you know, yeah. you know and all that lot. I presume they were still there, as you say, Roy Keane. What's that must be a daunting experience. Yeah, I came here. I signed the I signed the contract uh, three weeks before we had to go in for for training, and I'm not lying here. This is the truth. I don't think I slept for three weeks because I was I was thinking, what am I going to say to these players? Like the likes of David Beckham, Roy Keane, Gary Neville, Ryan Giggs, all all them players. Like, and um, I was all right, okay, fair enough. Three weeks later, I went in. Uh, I think I was in there two hours before training. So I was there before everybody else, sitting there like a like a like a, a young lad sitting in the corner. First person came in was David Beckham, and uh, he came up to me and shook my hand, and he says, "Hi, I'm David Beckham. Nice to meet you." And I just stared at him and just looked at him and said, "I know who you are." And I forgot to tell him my name. I didn't. I, I didn't tell him my name. I thought he knew me, but uh, came here. Uh, I've been in a lot of clubs before Manchester United. I was a whole city in Wigan, but that walking in the Manchester United, it, it was scary at the start. But see, at the end of the day. I felt like I'd been there for years and years because everybody made me feel so welcome at the club. It was a massive club, but every, even the big, big time players, uh, really mm. massive players, they were so down the earth with me, and it was brilliant to get to know them all. Awesome, mate. Um, so I'll open up for questions in a minute, but just before I do that, what what was the highlights at, at Manchester United for you personally? Uh, I've, got, I've said before, playing my first game like uh, at Manchester United, but of course winning the Premier League and winning the FA Cup as well. It's uh, when, when I'm 14, 15 years old, uh, living in Northern Ireland, saying I want to be a professional footballer. I would never thought I'd have a, a Premier League medal sitting in my house or an FA Cup medal. And uh, it's, 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 it's just over the moon. I still sometimes pinch myself, but oh, you know me, I'm just down the earth like, and I, I just talk to everybody and, and just tell them the stories, what I went through. I've had some good stories and I have some bad stories, but uh, you, they all make you the person you are today, like, and it, it's just fantastic to win the Premier League. Everybody's dream. No, no absolutely, mate. And the, the last question I'm going to ask actually is about the so we're on about your club career, which goes on and on. You know, so much so you're still playing, as we will get to in a minute. Mm-hmm. But, um, but your international career, like you said, to have an international cap is, is the greatest honour, obviously, for, for anybody for your country. What um, what was that like being with your? Well, first of all, making your debut for your international cap, and also. Going to, was it the World Cup you went to, or was it the Euros? It was the Euros 2016 yeah. in France. So, yeah, so what, yeah. what were these experiences like? Yeah, it was, the uh, experience was like, uh, I, t- I made my debut for the first, uh, for the for the senior team before I made my debut in the 21s. It was strange. It was <laughs> weird, very strange, like, but uh, my debut was 19. I played, we played in Thailand, uh, and my debut was when I was 19. And uh, it was supposed to be a year before, like because uh, one of the uh, we only had two keepers at the time, and the number one keeper got injured, and I thought I was going to play against the Germans, but then two days before a game, there was another keeper came in, so I was a bit disappointed. But the year later, I got my first cap, which uh, out in Thailand, and it was uh, it was fantastic. Like I, I still remember the day really clearly. You always do like and see my first game in the in in the English football. It's the same thing, and. Uh, I was uh, started. The, the other one was, uh, of course, making the Euros, but uh, starting the Euro campaign, I've played the first five games and got a really serious injury. I had really bad stomach problems and I was rushed in the hospital two days before the Romania game. And um, uh, the, the other keeper came in and he did fantastic and he never got dropped ever since that, uh, since I, since um, I got, I, I got rushed to hospital because he was playing really well. So the opportunity for me to get back on the team was very difficult. Uh, but it was still a pleasure for me to go to be sitting on the bench at the major tournament because we've, or you know, our size of our country is so small. Yeah. Like, and to, to qualify for a major tournament in, in international football was massive for our country. And uh, 
uh, when we lost the game against Wales, I had a little tear in my eye, just thinking to myself that this is the this is what we were all dreaming of to be be in a major tournament like, and it's 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 a great honour to be playing football like or soccer uh, uh, for your country. Hello, mate. Can you see me? Yeah, sorry, mate. I lost you. The uh, <coughs> lost you with Wi-Fi. Modern technology. Eh? Um, well, listen. I, I think probably the best thing to do now is uh, after that is to open up to some questions. I know that um, somebody put their hand up. Let me just find out who it was. I think it was uh, Shirley. So that mean Christian. Have you got a question, buddy? Uh, yeah. Uh, I have a question. Was it hard? Was it hard losing to our other national team, or was it kind of easy to get over with? L losing? Yeah. It's no. like to a national team, or like losing a really big game. No, was it's, it, never easy. it's never easy losing the game. Uh, I was brought up. I was brought up like uh, try and win everything you can, like, and it's just a, it's just a mentality I had when I was a young boy, and uh, it's just been stuck with me for my whole career. Uh, I never, I never like second best, but uh, sometimes if you work hard and your whole team played hard and played well, and you end up losing, uh, there's nothing you can do. You know what I mean? It's just one of those games. You can't do anything else. Uh, I remember playing for in the FA Cup final against uh, Arsenal in 2005, many, many years ago, and we were, we were all over Arsenal. We couldn't score, and end up going to penalties, and we lost on penalties, and. Uh, there's nothing you can do on that. It's just it's, it's just a lottery. But sometimes it's it's never easy. I it's never easy losing. But sometimes you have to just take it on the chin. Sometimes, don't you? Yes. Definitely. Yeah. And just so you guys know, um, when I rang Roy up yesterday, so he's still playing now. Okay. So he played, as he said, he plays for uh, Dungannon. Had a game yesterday, lost three 0 And when I spoke to him, it was probably no more, no less. Was still as gutted as he would have been after the Arsenal game, I'm sure. So probably to answer your question, Christian, every game, nobody likes losing and, and Roy is a, definitely a testament to that. <laughs> um, That's right. I've got me. My wife, uh, every time uh, my wife, uh, she says, uh, when you lose a game, she just stays away from me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Like, yeah. My wife says that, and we don't even play anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, question. Um, Sam, I mean, I'm not sure. he's, he's written the thing out, but if he's comfortable to come on and speak, he is our goalkeeper, and he is yeah. 82 foot tall. So if if Sam, if you'd like to come on and ask your question, uh, please unmute yourself. Okay. Good lad. Sorry, my dog's barking. Oh, it's okay. It's okay, Sam. All right, Sam, fire away. Um, so, how did the pressure of playing keeper like teach you how to deal with like re like the pressure? Yeah. Um, see, I I don't call it pressure. Um, uh, I just uh, have nerves. I get nerves, but I, I never put myself under pressure. Just if you put yourself under pressure, and you think too much uh, bad thoughts, like, and don't use your nerves in the right way. That's that will that will put you the, uh, in the wrong step to go forward. You know what I mean? But uh, pressure, you should be enjoying for uh, you should be enjoying football or soccer or being a goalkeeper. Uh, it's a lot of people talk about pressure. Yeah, there's pressure in life as well. Like, but for me, it was I was I just enjoyed being a goalkeeper. You make you're gonna make mistakes. We're gonna make mistakes when we're not, we're not robots. So uh, what I've learned from over my career, uh, since I was a young lad, was to uh, go out and enjoy it, but use them nerves in the right way. And uh, because uh, you always have nerves, and even this day and age, I still go out. I played I played yesterday, and I was on the pitch, and I was still had butterflies in my stomach. So uh, don't put yourself under pressure. Don't think of anything bad in your head. Be positive for everything you do in life, and as a goalkeeper because you need to have self-confidence as a goalkeeper. Very, very big thing to have as a goalkeeper. Self-confidence is the main thing. If you lose that confidence, uh, you just have to keep working and training and get that confidence back again. Okay. Yeah, I think, I think that's you. a good point as well, uh, Roy, because 
Um, Sam, as I say, is uh, is our goalkeeper. He's only just started playing in goal. So, is there any, you know, obviously you said about confidence. Is there any advice you give to any young goalkeeper kind of starting out? Yeah, this day and age, just uh, it's more it's more like playing out from the back with your feet. You have to be very good at the ball at your feet. So, and uh, you have to be really agile as well. It's just a goalkeeper's changed completely. And uh, if you can work... Uh, Sam, how old are you, if you don't mind me asking? How old is he? Sam? 11. 11. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's a good age. Like So if I was you, I would just work, work, work on your feet, work. Uh, agile. And hopefully, if you get a goalkeeping coach, and hopefully one day I might come over and coach you, and uh, it's all about technique as well at a certain age when you're a young goalkeeper. It's really, really important to have good technique. But uh, if at the meantime, do a lot of ladder work, a lot of feet work, a lot of bo- uh, ball work with your feet. And then hopefully in the near future, I could come over and co- uh, coach your technique and stuff. Fingers crossed. Okay, Sam? Thanks. Good lad. Fantastic, mate. Um, Tom's put... Can I just say something about Sam while we're on there, Laurie? Sorry to interrupt you, mate. Interesting Sam saying about pressure there. That was his question initially. And Sam Sam always, I'm surprised because Sam always plays with a smile on his face, even though he's just started and he does make mistakes like all of us do on the field. But he doesn't give away that he's he's feeling that pressure. So good job, Sam. And, uh, you know, because it's a, it's a difficult position to play in if you do make a mistake, you know, it often stands out more than everybody else. But uh, but Sam does play with a smile on his face and he's got he has a great attitude. So I was yeah. surprised about that's, that. That's what, that's what it's all about, though, Chris. Good attitude, you know what I mean? But some keepers don't come out and speak about the, the pressures, uh, if they have pressure. But for me, uh, when I coach goalkeepers in Northern <clears> Ireland, I says, like, you could be the happiest guy ever, but they've still got a lot in the head. They have to come out and talk about it and talk to the coaches and uh, get it out, of, uh, out in the open. And uh, Sam came out and said about pressure. Yeah, fantastic. At least now we can work on that. And and uh, like what I said to him, it's uh, use it in the right way if you can. Like, and don't put yourself under pressure. Good lad, Sam. Yeah. Yeah, as well. I'll turn the video off. Oh. <laughs> um, right, we've got... Uh, Tom says, my dad wants to know if you've ever got the hairdryer treatment from Sir Alex. So before you answer that, Roy... Probably just best to tell a lot of the boys and girls on here. The hairdryer is basically Alex Ferguson, the head coach we were talking about before, screaming in your face as loud as possible. And um, so that is the world famous hairdryer treatment. So, Roy, were you on the end of that much? I was. I thought it was going to be. Um, remember playing a wee game against Spurs at home, and uh, the ball nearly went over the line. None <laughs> of these. None of these young children. Uh, could remember it like I can't even remember it, but people uh, always bring it up like, and it nearly went over the line. Nice scooped it back, and uh, you haven't got the video. Have you got the video there? No. I can. Uh, <laughs> you, can you, get the video? do you want me to have the video, or do you? Know? <laughs> Put it up and show the kids. Show the kids. Like, the kids. And, Wait, no, one second. Uh, so, so that's why I thought I was going to get the hair dryer treatment. I was nervous. It took me a long time to walk off the pitch. Anyhow, it took me about <laughs> 10, 10 minutes to walk off the pitch. So, guys, um, can you get it? Look. I get it up. One second. Let me just share the screen. So, this is when Roy says it was um, nearly a goal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, put it this way. There, I've just searched it, Roy, and it says um, what the topic is Roy Carroll goal that never was. Okay. So, you can decide whether that's. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to share it to everyone. Here we go. Share. Here we go. Can everybody see that? Here we go. Yeah. I know. Investor, and it was the Kentasta Ratka Suritus. Roy Carroll. Oh, it's a bit blurred. We might sit in a different angle right now. It's clear. Oh, it's clear. You got it. In- Never over the line. Look at it. it's not over the line. <laughs> so as you can see, it was um, very, very close to uh, potentially being one. Clean um, sheet, clean sheet. But that 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 was the incident uh, where I thought, oh, here we go. I'm going to get in a lot of trouble with uh, Sir Alex. 
And uh, I went in the changing rooms 10 minutes later after the final whistle, just walking really slowly. And I sat down, my hands on my head. And so Alex said to me, what happened? And I, uh, we, I called him boss, came here, boss. I uh, took my hair off the ball. I was going to throw the ball out to Gary Neville to my right back. And uh, and, he, uh, and I just took my hair off the ball and just went over my shoulder. And he turned around and said, great reaction, though. Uh, I never gave up, never gave up. I could have just gave up and let the, let the ball go over the line. Which I never and kept it before kept it out. Yeah, and I, I think joking aside, that's the you know that that's the best thing part about that. I know we've spoken about this before, but you know how many people sit, stand there, you know, put their head in their hands and watch it go in. And like you say, even when it's behind the line, you you know it'd be easy to stop, but you didn't, and you reacted, and you know you almost hurt your luck, didn't you, on that occasion? Uh, oh, well, it wasn't a goal anyway. Think, the first goal, if it had been. It yeah, yeah. But but when there's seventy thousand Manchester United fans there watching, you have to try and do something, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, it, Chris, it, I've only got names. Sorry, Amy. Is that um, Vincent? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Hey, buddy. Do you want to ask your question? Uh, yeah. Go when did me. you start seriously training as a goalkeeper? Yeah, uh, see, I went, in, I went in goals when I was 14. That's what I said before at the start. Uh, was uh, I started growing at 14. I was going in and out, in and out of goals because when the keeper got injured, I went in. But uh, I was a striker until I was 14. But then uh, the, the goalkeeping training, I never had goalkeeping training in my country. So I just learned from uh, my dad. My dad was a goalkeeper, so I used to watch him a lot. And I just watched uh, goalkeepers on TV. And then when the serious goalkeeping happened was when I was 23 years old, when I went to Manchester tonight. That's when I got full-time goalkeeping training every day. And I was quite lucky. I, had, I was quite natural as a goalkeeper. But as I said before to young Sam, like, my technique wasn't there. And uh, at 23, I was still learning the technique. Uh, so it took me a little bit longer because I had really bad habits uh, when I got that age. So uh, started off started off in goals at fourteen, but I never really got the proper training uh, attitude with, with a goal, full time goalkeeping coach until I was twenty three. Great question, though. Uh, it is a good question. I find it amazing that you mm. got moved to Manchester United and never had a goalkeeping coach until that point. Incredible. I had I had co goalkeeping coaches like probably once or twice a month. It wasn't like yeah. every day, like in England. But, uh, you know yourself back in them days. It was like. Uh, just the top league that had full-time goalkeeping coaches and uh, any, everything else down below. But now I think every club in England has goalkeeping coaches, which is brilliant for the younger keepers this day and age. Definitely. Um, Jake's got a good question. Uh, I'm a centre-back, uh, so what can I do to help my goalkeeper? Um, I just think, it's, uh, for me personally, when I'm a goalkeeper, I, I, I give them a lot of advice. I get, talk to them, but uh, for me, um, just information people i talk to the defenders defenders talk to midfielders and it's, it's just good information on the pitch and that will help you in a long way because it's uh, uh, you see the whole players in front so you have to talk and give good information to players players in front of you absolutely yeah and i think that you know jake we're in a uh, country where obviously football was previously it's not anymore but football uh, football is a huge sport, obviously, and probably the number one sport, isn't it, in the world? And it's all about the moves and, you know, all this stuff. So, uh, and the plays. And I think that how I would see it from you is your your job is to protect um, the goalkeeper. You, you are the last line of defence. And sometimes we lose, you know, sight of that. We think, oh, we've got to do this, we've got to do that, where really you are the, you know, you're the last form of defence for us. So, so you've got to have that relationship with people where nobody's getting through and, you know, they've got to earn the right to get through. So as, as Roy said, I think communication is everything. You see, anybody seen the Liverpool game yesterday? Uh, the keeper comes running out and he didn't shout keeper's ball and he collided with a centre half. You know what I mean? So even happens in the, at the highest level. It, it's just concentration at, uh, at a high level. Even no matter what level you play at, you have to concentrate and, and give information because when I shout for the ball, my defenders will run on the line in case I drop it and help me out in case I drop it and and things like that there. And that's all we have to work as a team. And uh, that's what defenders and the goalkeepers are as a, as a small team. And we'll have to give uh, good advice. And that's it. Brilliant. Thanks, mate. Good question, Jake. Um, Dominic, I'm not letting you get away with um, 
text in the question. You've come in the full gear, so I'm going to need you to unmute yourself so you can ask the question. That's all right, buddy. <laughs> if you want to, anyway. What's the hardest spot to block a shot? Which is the hardest? As a goalie, uh, is it low shots, high shots, corners? What's the hardest to oh. defend as a goalie? Very good question, Dominic. Good, good question. That is for me, because I'm six foot three. Uh, I was six foot four, but I'm getting smaller now because I'm getting old, you see. So uh, <laughs> it was always the low shots for me. It was always the low shots. Uh, but anything above my anything above my knees, it was quite it was quite uh, easy for me. But uh, anything below, it was very difficult because you have to get down very quick. But uh, over years and years of training and working on the training ground, uh, you do a lot of technique by getting up quick and getting down quick. So it helped me over the years by working with top quality goalkeeping coaches. Now it takes you about three weeks to get up, doesn't it? You should have saw me getting up this morning, mate, after the game yesterday. <laughs> Had a jump in the hot bath. <laughs> um, it's funny as well, because we've got... Dom recorded a song for us, and, you know, you can see he's a huge Man United fan, and it, it, it's yeah. called Glory, Glory FC National. It sounds very much like... Glory, glory, Manchester United. I don't know what's, you know, what's <laughs> probably just a complete coincidence. Dom, who's your favourite? Who's your favourite player at Manchester United? Bruno Fernandez. He's a good player, isn't he? He's a good player. You didn't see the game today, did you? That's okay. I won't say. It. Don't 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 bother watching. Okay, it wasn't the best of games. The time, wasn't it? Was it was one one. It was one yeah, one. We're still second, though. We're still second. Still a long way to go. Um, Tom, thanks, Dan, for that, buddy. Uh, Tom has put, what's your best save ever? Do you remember? It's the one that stands out that, that is your best save ever. Uh, I think it's, it's probably not the best, like, but it's probably the uh, it was importance of the, the game. I think it was the semi-finals against Arsenal at Aston Villa. It was... Uh, it came off the post and I fell over to get get, uh, get the first save and uh, it came off the crossbar, sorry. And I had to get up really quick and just deflected over the crossbar again. So I think that was, uh, it was a good save. I think it was uh, just, but it wasn't one of the best, but I'm I'm going to pick that one, Nari, because it was the importance of the, the game. Yeah. It was a massive game. Especially beating Arsenal. It was really nice to beat Arsenal. Yeah, definitely. I know. Um, well, you remember who to... hit it, Roy? I... Uh, no, I just go so quick. I, I see when you play the game, you'd, sometimes I look back and watch videos of myself and I say, I can't remember doing that in the game. <laughs> things just happen. Things just happen in the game. And then you look back in the video that night. Because in football now, in soccer now, they, they, watch, they, they send the video through. And uh, for me, I watch my good, my good games, my bad games you play in because you learn from everything. And sometimes I look at myself and say, what am I doing there? And I can't remember doing that and stuff like that there. But came here, uh, you learn from everything. And uh, I still learn. I'm 43 and I'm still playing and I'm still learning. I've made a few mistakes like yesterday. I should have been catching the ball instead of punching it. Like, uh, Especially with my long hair now. Uh, I, I think I'm like a, one of these uh, Spanish goalkeepers now. <laughs> Not um, a problem I have now. Yeah, neither of us. That's an FC national trait. No hair. I just thought that was the style, isn't it, over there? FC now. It's the, it's the club cut. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sir Guy, do you want to come on and ask your question, buddy? I know we've got a uh, FC national newscomer here. But welcome. Sure. Hey, Roy, how's it going? My question is um, what was uh, your biggest challenge in your career and how did you overcome it? I um I had a I had a serious injury uh when I was at West Ham and uh, it took me be fair I'm not I'm not gonna hide from it like but but it took me a long time to get over it. Like uh when I was a young player, all I wanted to do, like I said before, was uh, play football, train every day, play football. Once I got this serious injury, back injury, I was out for nearly nine months, ten months, and uh I couldn't handle it. Uh, I didn't know how to handle it, like nobody spoke to me about anything. All I had to do was come in, get treatment every day, uh, just missing the game, missing playing. I was a bit selfish uh, because there's a lot of other people out, out there who uh, had serious injuries and couldn't come back playing football. But for me, I didn't see that. I just seen the bad things. What's going to happen to me? Am I going to get back in? And 
I got really badly, really bad depression. And I was fighting it for years and years and years. And that's, that's how I ended up playing in Greece because I had to go away, uh, go away with my family and just change my lifestyle all over again because the depression got so badly for nearly four years. And uh, I was lucky enough to get another chance to play football again because I was out of the game for so long. And um, I ended up not having a club for nine months, which was very, very difficult for me. And uh, I just fell out of love with football, which was very difficult. Was uh, for me always was my dream to be a footballer. But when that uh, when that fell out of love of playing football was away, I just didn't know what I was doing, and I just didn't see the, the light at the end of the tunnel. And lucky enough, I got my life back on track and came back playing again, and uh, um, got back playing from my country and playing in Champions League football and Europa League football again, which was fantastic for me. But that's what I was saying about you get ups and downs in football and. And for me now, I try and tell young players, like, you're going to get injured in, in soccer. You're definitely, it's, it's, the, it's the parcel of the game. Like, uh, it's contact sport. You're going to get injured. So be mentally prepared for little things like this here. Or even if you have something else outside soccer, because all my life was to be, be a professional soccer player. I never thought about anything else. So if you can think about something else to do as well, in case something like this did happen to you, uh, it will help in the long run. All right, mate. Um, Dom's got another question. I missed, sorry, which was, can you explain what made Sir Alex Ferguson such a great coach? And is there any advice that he gave you that you still remember this day and that was important? Yeah. Uh, I don't I don't say, I'm not, I'm not saying Sir Alex was the best. He wasn't a coach for to me uh, because he wasn't uh, coaching. He never coached. Uh, yeah. he, was a, he was a great manager because... Uh, he knew what to say at the right time, and uh, he always had really good number twos. He, uh, I think my first year, man, you, um, he never really brought any any number two assistants in, and then uh, I think it was my second or third year when Carlos Quelas came in, a Portuguese coach, and he was an excellent co- uh, assistant coach. Uh, but for me, Sir Alex was a manager, and uh, when he came in the changing rooms, he knew when uh, the players respected him that much. Um, they kept quiet and, and he, he talked like sometimes he came in at half time and he didn't have to talk because if we had if we were playing bad he would just walk in and walk back out again and that's it and we knew we have to pick a game up because uh, when you play for Manchester United you have to give 100% every every time you're on the training pitch and every time you're on the pitch and uh, as you said before like uh, his hair trial treatment uh, I never seen it lucky enough in my four years, but I've heard a few stories about it. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to get one of those. <laughs> um, let's have a look. Uh, Christian, I think you got another question. Is that right, buddy? I actually, I have two. I have, no, that's sorry, you're going to have one. Nobody likes to show off. Okay. <laughs> Go on. Uh, my first one is, what is the team that you had best memories of? Like it has yeah. the best memory, like best save or whatever. It, okay. Like uh, it would have been, uh, of course, Manchester United. Uh, that was yeah. a massive, massive club. Everybody knew Manchester United from all over the world. Uh, that was probably a great club for me. But uh, what happened through my career with the depression at West Ham, I think Olympiagos in Greece changed my lifestyle. It changed my life completely around. And uh, uh, the people out in Greece was really good as well. So uh, Manchester United would have been my number one and uh, uh, Olympiagos, my number two club. Okay. My second question was... <laughs> He's doing the second question here. <laughs> Go on ahead. Go on ahead, young man. Uh, would your favourite team also be Manchester United or did you like a different team, like the national team that you play on? Or like my... My team when I was a young boy is a team called Glasgow Rangers up in Scotland. You probably haven't heard of them. But, what is uh, it called? Uh, Glasgow Rangers. Glasgow Rangers. Oh, okay. I'll look it up. And I was quite lo- I was quite lucky to go up there for six months. I was uh, I was a player of Glasgow Rangers as well. But uh, it was short lived. I was only there for six months. Okay. Well, that's all my questions. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for your questions. Cheers. Look after yourself. Um, right, mate. Just last couple. That's all right. And then I'm conscious of the time. Um, no 
Jake's but do you well this will probably be more about Mikey because uh, you've known him for a lot longer but do you have any funny stories about Laurie or Mikey <laughs> oh that you can tell <laughs> I can't tell no no not not serious stories no we're just uh, hey, I turned my nice. camera off Okay. Have you? No, no stories of Mike. No stories. Can't say. <laughs> um, you, Christine, one sec. Um, uh, no. on, Chris, go for it. Yeah, hey, Roy. I, I was just want to go back to something he said earlier on because we've been talking. It, it's put good timing because we've been talking to the boys and girls about attitudes in training and training the way with the, with the same intensity as you would play a game. And you mentioned it earlier on when you got to Manchester United, and probably all the all the clubs are pretty much the same. But how serious did it get in training at Manchester United? You know, how how intense was it in practice? Oh, it was very intense, very intense. Like it's uh, the first the first day I came in. Like I tell you the truth, like um, my first season, I was that tired. Not not just uh, fitness tired. I was mentally tired as well because of the the high intensity of training, and. After that first season, I think I must have slept for nearly a week because uh, it was so it was so high intensity training. Uh, every day you come in, you're given 100% uh, in training. The players you don't play on a Saturday. We, I think I was in. I think the whole season I probably only had four weeks off the whole season because we were playing so many games. So you're playing like Saturday and maybe Tuesday or Wednesday in the Champions League, and the players you don't play would have a would have to do an ac extra work. And the players you did play would come in and just do a cool down, but that would have been seven days a week. Um, we'd be lucky to get a a, couple, a day off like during the week because so many games. But the the intensity was really really high. And the other club where I, as I said before, was Olympia Argos, which was I never seen this before in my career until I went to Olympia Argos. Uh, there was a there was a manager from Spain. He became the Barcelona manager, but went before he went to, before he went to Barcelona, he was the Olympia Argos manager. And we only trained for 45 minutes. And it was pure, pure intensity training for 45 minutes. It was so quick. Unbelievable. And that was us, 45 minutes off the training pitch. And I just realised why he's doing it. Because you play 45 minutes and you have a break and you come back out for 45 minutes. Uh, I think it was uh, I think it was good. But that everybody's got different, uh, different standards in training. But for me, the highest clubs always play high intensity training. Mm. No, thanks, Roy. No problem, Chris. Yeah, I think we're just about that up as well, Chris. We, I mean, that is what we're trying to get across to the boys and the girls. It's that's not our club. That's just that's probably one of the biggest things I notice in this country that the best players expect to turn up and do what they want, and then just turn up on a Saturday and play. And then you know, there's a reason why a lot of the best players get caught over here at you know 14, 15 because everybody else has been working behind in, in the background. So we're trying to you know put kind of put that message across to people and. Uh, we think it's really important, obviously, as you've just said, to to train as you play and and get that in, you know into our mentality at an early age. Yeah, no, I think I think the main thing now with football is all about is like it's it's a work work ethic and training. Uh, people uh, uh, like these young players will come in later on next two or three years and do extra training, do extra work. Uh, don't just uh, just don't go to go higher make a limit and the next month to go higher, go higher, go higher and push yourself as far as you can. Because uh, if you just want to stay at the same level the whole way, you know, it's going to be very diff difficult for you. But coaches and managers want to see young players with full energy coming in the training half an hour before training and do your warm up and get stretched before training. Uh, what I'm trying to say to the young keepers over here in Northern Ireland is like they turn up like two minutes before training. I said, no, I want you in half an hour before training because you yeah. have to do your warm up, get your stretching done, and then we're on that training pitch for eleven o'clock, and that's us. That's us done. I got that from United because them players used to come in an hour and a half before training. It was just so unbelievable, uh, professional. What these players and these players were on a lot of money. They didn't have to do it, but they wanted to succeed. They wanted to, to go as high as they can in the in the career, and they wanted to go further. That's why Ronaldo's still playing at 34, 35. If I, met, if I did a video of Ronaldo uh, when he first came to Manchester United until I left Manchester United, the training, what he did in between, in between uh, his uh, lifestyle was unbelievable training. Everything's worked around his soccer. And that's what you young lads and young girls have to try and do and give everything you can 
because it goes so quick. Trust me, it goes really, really quick. Mm. You think you're young, but uh, it goes really quick. But you enjoy it. You need to enjoy it as well. That's the main thing. If you don't enjoy the soccer, uh, it's, it's very hard uh, to stay in love with the game. Mm. And, and you've obviously mentioned them, but what was that like with Ronaldo? You know, you are watching it happen. Did you think, because, you know, there's a lot of stories about the first year he, or first two years he could have got released or sold, should I say, and that kind of thing. But did, did you see it come in? Did you think it would it'd be as, as good as he has? Come here. I, when, we, when we came back from America, we had pre-season in America and we dropped off and uh, out in Portugal, play a sport in Lisbon where he was playing. I think he was 17 at the time. And he was just unbelievable. He had the skill, he had the talent, but he didn't have the strength. And uh, when he came to Manchester United, he couldn't even speak a word of English. And the dedication of that guy, after two months at Manchester United, he started speaking English. And uh, he he was speaking better English than me. And uh, (laughs) see, see Uh the biggest biggest thing for him was like, uh, he had the butt weight on because he was so, he was that skinny. And he was getting knocked all over the place in English football. But he built that. He worked. That's what he did. He worked and worked in the gym nearly every day to get that strength. And you see him today. What? What is he? Thirty-four now. Thirty-five. Yeah. He's still playing. He's still playing a high level at Juventus. He's he's incredible. Everything he has a swimming pool. He has a gym. It's not for show. He uses it because that's what it's all about. His lifestyle was all about his his career as a professional soccer player. Mm. that's amazing and, and as you say fair, fair play to him but you know he deserves everything he gets out of it yeah true um, alright mate uh, Chris any last question I was, uh, who called you about you the uh, who called you when you got selected for Northern Ireland how did that happen did you get a phone call a text well, or email uh, or, how does that work in them days you, you got a letter you got a letter from the cl- uh, the cl- to the club and uh, you say you're on the I was on standby a few times, and then uh, when I was like, uh, I think it was 18, and I got uh, the call up, uh, you in the squad, and that's how you. It was just a letter. This day and age now, it's that the manager might ring you up, he ring you up and say you in the squad, and then about a week later, the the they announce all the team then uh, on TV and on the radio, whatever. But them days, it was just a letter. Yeah, uh, there you go. You have to you have to write a letter back and say, yeah, I'm okay, I'd be okay to come. <laughs> There's no mobile phone, no mobile phones, them days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I bet you still got that letter, haven't you? Uh, uh, come here, the club has it. Does it? Yeah, the club has it. How about that? Really? That's I wish, I, I wish I kept it. Mm. Yeah, nice memories, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah, good one, mate. We do have, sorry, one last question is from let's have a look. Alistair. Do you want to put your do you want to ask the question, Alistair? Do you want me to read it? No. No, you want me to ask it? Okay. All right. Are you, are you wearing your shirt, Alistair? Yeah. No, I thought nice. he was. I thought he was. I'm sorry. And actually, no, I didn't mean to. <laughs> oh, Christian. Christian. Yeah. <laughs> You're on. We can all hear you. <laughs> oh, my God. I actually don't like drop the phone. That's all right, mate. Just put it on mute one second. I'm going to ask Alistair. <laughs> How do you not run out of energy? Alistair says, because Alistair's a very. Uh... What position is he again? Alistair, well, Alistair plays up front. He's a striker. And uh, he is very much run the channels, running behind all day. Was, was Alistair over here in Nottingham that time I was over? No. No. Alistair, no, no. no, that was Andrew. Was that, that Andrew? Was Chris, yeah. So yeah, so he's wondering how you you know you want about the intensity in Manchester United and that how how do you not run out of energy? I think you know I'm presuming the answer is your lifestyle around outside of it, but you know to what degree and how do you work that out? I, I think uh, with uh, behind the scenes you have uh, your di- you have people who talk to you about your diet, uh, what you should do after games and before games, uh, which helped me a lot as well. But uh, as I said, the first year was very difficult for me because it was completely different. Uh, coming in from a, a lower, lower standard of football up to the high standard of football. But uh, I think everything what Manchester United did was they looked after you. They looked after you really well with the di- uh, people talk, doing your diet and keeping your fitness in the right way. And you have your personal fitness coach as well. And uh, you have masseurs. You have massages before training and after training. So uh, when, you're, when you're a massive club, uh, they can bring people like that in. So... Uh, 
it was quite easy to get used to it. It's like anything, if you keep working and keep doing things, you go to a different club, it might take you a couple of weeks, it might take you a couple of months to get used to it, but you will always get the, get the hang of it as soon as quick, uh, you, as quick as possible. Sure. All right, mate. Uh, well, the actual very last question is something that I'll answer, and that's from Vincent. How was it financially as a soccer player? So <laughs> you don't need to answer this, Roy. <laughs> Vincent, you were very, very good. Um, and hopefully in 10 years time will be you you'll find out for yourself how good it is okay <laughs> um Roy thanks ever so much mate I know it's late there we really appreciate your time um thanks for giving the insight to all of the players and and giving it your time so uh good luck for the rest of the season buddy and as I say hopefully we'll get an opportunity to get you out as soon as the the travel ban and everything visas etc open we'll get you out and uh, we'll get you working with uh, with Sam all right buddy Cheers, Roy. I wish you all the best. Take care, everyone. All the best. Yeah, now. Bye bye. Thanks for doing this for us, Roy. Appreciate it, mate. Bye bye. Bye bye. Cheers. See ya.